Forward Guidance is brought to you by VanEck, a global leader in asset management since 1955. You'll be hearing more about VanEck ETFs later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. Wow, uh, very glad to be doing this. Thank you, everyone, for, for turning out. Uh, we today are we talking about macro, so we're talking about central banks, interest rates, currencies, stocks, bonds, and that includes crypto. I mean, crypto definitely does uh, respond. You know, pretty pretty uh, correlated to the stock market, um, so that's uh, why that's important. Um, today we've got uh, Michael Howell of Cross Border Capital, Joseph Wang of uh, FedGuy.com, Julian Brigden of MI2 Partners. And uh, Johnny Matthews of, of Super uh, Macro. Gentlemen, thank you so much uh, for, for joining us. Uh, let's start off with wh- what is your current macro outlook on uh, asset prices and how does that depend on liqu- your view on liquidity uh, in interest rates and the economy? Let's go down the line. Michael, starting with you. Well, hi, good morning. Well, I think the answer is that since I believe wholeheartedly in liquidity, I've got to say that uh, I'm optimistic. Uh, and asset markets generally are going to rise. Now, uh, I put that in the frame of saying, well, maybe we could see a little bit of adjustment in the next couple of months. Um, markets have kind of you know, become a little bit extended. But generally speaking, what you've got to look at is the long term. And the long term is radically different. And I can't keep emphasizing that enough. And the reason it's different is the fiscal situation worldwide in the West is so terrible, right, but the only way these governments can afford to spend and afford the commitments they've made is to start monetizing. And monetization is happening right now. And what I would say in briefly, and we can come back to this, is the question to ask is, what is a safe asset? I'll tell you one thing, it's not a government bond. But that's what the authorities keep saying. Government bonds are safe assets. Think of this as an analogy. Go back to 1919, okay? after the end of the First World War and just before the German hyperinflation, what was the safe asset then? Government, German government bonds, okay? How did that end? It ended really badly. The older generations invested in government bonds. They had their wealth wiped out. The younger generations saw the monetary inflation and they put money in the stock market. The question is, is crypto the new equivalent of the German, of the German stock market in a hyperinflation? And that's the important thing to think about because it is. Joseph? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. And I agree with Michael's assessment. I think asset prices are going to do very well. They've done very well. They, we may pause, but I think we're going to continue to surge for the coming years. And my view is ultimately also based upon the fiscal situation. Now, the way that I look at this is if you are a government and you are issuing a lot of debt, uh, another way to look at that is basically you're printing money. Uh, for example, let's say if I gave you $1,000 in cash, well, that, that's money, right? But what if I gave you $1,000 in U.S. Treasuries, right? $1,000 in U.S. Treasuries, you know, it's not as liquid as cash. Maybe I won't be able to buy dinner with it, but, you know, I could sell it for cash. I could borrow against it. It's an asset. So if you have uh, a fiscal deficit in the U.S. of at least 5% for the coming uh, foreseeable future um, and similar situations in other countries, uh, one way you can think about it is you're basically printing money. So fiscal deficit is, is basically uh, it's going to be a really uncontrollable going forward, and that's going to put upward pressure on all asset prices. Now, the other leg to this, I think, is that we're heading towards a global rate-cutting cycle. Now, over the past couple of years, we had inflation go up throughout the world, and so central banks react very aggressively. Um, but as we've seen inflation come down a lot, it's well telegraphed that we're heading into a global rate cut cycle that that could probably start maybe toward the middle or the end of this year. And as we all know, rate cuts are positive for asset prices. So uh, I'm, I'm very positive on asset prices uh, for the coming years, un- unless the fiscal deficit gets resolved, of course, which I don't bet on. So we've got two bulls. Uh, Julian? What are you Morning, everyone. So uh, Look, long term, I don't disagree about the fiscal thing. I think we're sliding to, uh, to what is uh, technically referred to as fiscal dominance, where central banks increasingly have to focus on keeping their boss solvent as opposed to uh, controlling uh, inflation and employment. Uh, but my focus is a little bit more short term. Mm-hmm. And so when I look at things short term, um, there's unquestionably, I think we have a bubble in certain sectors of the US equity market. 
Um, you know, NVIDIA, if you look at it, it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it is a bloody duck, right? This thing is a bubble. Now, at what point do we hit, you know, does it have a final surge? That would be my guess. So in that sense, you know, I'm with Michael and I'm with Joseph on this idea that we've got somewhat positive upsides to go. Janet Yellen has done an amazing job at essentially offsetting everything the Fed has done to try and tighten liquidity. Her job is singular. It's to get her boss reelected. Uh, there is an institutional fear in the Fed, too, of the orange man, uh, I think potentially rightly so, uh, when it comes to the policy he could enact. Um, so, you know, she's got the ability to draw down the TGA, uh, 800 billion there that she can spend. And so, you know, if you even if you get a wobble, I suspect they deploy that. So into um, into year end, I suspect, you know, you're buying dips basically in the equity market. Now, when it comes to the bond market, I'm a structural bear. I think that we are in a 30-year bear market in bonds. I think the median rate for 10-year treasuries left to their own would probably be about 8% by 2050. Um, there is just a global shortfall in savings. We're moving into a period where, you know, supply aside, right, we're trying to shove an increasingly large amount of debt into a shrinking or flat market in terms of demand. And so I think the biggest risk into year end is once again another sell off in the bond market. I see inflation coming back quite hard in the second half of the year um, and really quite hard. Um, but I agree that I think the Fed seems determined to try and start the cutting cycle. But I think they're setting us up for policy error. And I think what's really happening right now is we're beginning to get a cyclical upturn in growth. So if you start to look at some of the cheap assets, particularly in the commodity sector, you're starting to see those assets perform as if growth is re-accelerating, which it actually is. Um, so as I said, I think for the central bank, certainly the Fed to be cutting rates is clinically insane, but they're going to do it anyway. So it just has consequences and you have to trade those consequences. Good morning. I'm very much on the same page as Julian in, in, in that respect. I have bearish fixed income. I have been for a long time. I think the central bank... It's certainly going to cut rates, almost certainly, and I do think it's an error. I think um, what they've done, the, the rate hikes, have had a, a fairly small impact on the household sector and the corporate sector. The household sector in America typically have a 30-year mortgage, and the average mortgage rate is 3.7% or 3.8%, and they're not moving. They're not moving house, so they're locked in at this rate. And the, the, the policy changes that have been done by the Fed haven't really had the kind of impact that you might have expected. The Fed talks about long and variable lags with, um, with the, the, from the time when they change policy to the time it has an impact on the economy. But the Fed got the first 425 basis points of rate hikes done before the start of last year. Well, the final two quarters of last year, growth averaged... 4% uh, over those final two quarters. Now, you know, by that stage of the game, by the second half of last year, those rate hikes should have had an impact, but so far we're just not seeing it. <laughs> Same thing for the corporate sector. The corporate sector had a decade to term out its debt, which, which it did very successfully. Now, sure, there'll be some zombie companies that will go to the wall as a result of these rate hikes, but, you know, that's... People were complaining about keeping zombie companies alive for the past decade. It's time we had a bit of a clear out, uh, a bit of, let's say, creative destruction. So that's, that process is taking place. We are seeing some of the weaker companies in distress. But by and large, the economy has done extremely well, regardless of what the, the Fed has done. And if you look at um, household wealth, it has just gone through the roof. So I agree with Julian. I don't think I think the Fed will cut, but I don't think they'll get far in this cutting cycle. Um, and I do think it's a mistake. And I think inflation is going to rear its ugly head again. Thank you. Uh, Julian, what are the consequences of a situation where economists at the Fed had anticipated that there would be an economic slowdown and that you know five and a half percent interest rates from zero would uh, severely curtail uh, uh, spending, investment, and you know, crash the equity market. That was the expectation. Now, Bitcoin's at all-time highs, as you know, some in our audience might, might have noticed.
Stock markets at, at, at all-time highs, things that are looking quite good. What are the consequences of that uh, uh, for, for the economy? So I'm a big believer in what I, in this thesis that I call hyper-financialization. So it's a bizarre, somewhat uh, counter-logical sort of setup whereby you would think that the real economy should lead financial assets. The real economy should set growth, it should set inflation, set bond yields, it should set profits should lead equity, should lead the bond market. But actually in the US, it's not how it works. In the US, uh, the equity market pretty much sets the direction of the economy uh, from two different uh, things. Firstly, in terms of corporate behavior. Um, and it's very simple. If stocks are rising, CEOs hire. If stocks are falling, CEOs fire. And the same goes for CapEx. And then you have a wealth effect, uh, as Johnny was alluded to. And the numbers are truly mind-blowing, guys, right? In the last four years, household wealth has increased $47 trillion. Nominal GDP is 28, right? And um, as Johnny was alluded, you know, if I look at myself, I've got my mortgage locked in at 2.65%, mate. Uh, <laughs> there we go. 2.65%. <laughs> uh, I think that's probably one of the best recommendations I ever gave on Real Vision. Um, I'm, I'm long stocks and I'm long assets. So what has the Fed done to me? Absolutely bugger all. <laughs> and so the reality of the situation is, is that far from, as I said, from slowing, and it looks like we went a weak patch. If you look at claims data, if you look at challenger layoff data, they've all reversed all the weakness that was, that was penciled in at the beginning of last year. And they're now uh, on the cusp of potentially reaccelerating. Um, and it's all about, in that sense, it's about asset prices, driving financial conditions. And I find it, amazing that Jay Powell came into office, Jack, and he said to us, look, the way that rates work, shh, and this was an annoying thing that all the macro guys knew, is via financial conditions. So we all went and looked at financial conditions. And all of a sudden, financial conditions have eased inordinately, and he's not bloody mentioning them at all, right? So what are the consequences? I think you've got an incredibly robust economy. You've got a bunch of corporates who are ready to re-accelerate hiring, Reaccelerate capex, and when you haven't dealt with underlying inflation and you're sitting with unemployment under four percent, that's an incredibly dangerous setup, right? In terms of inflation. Well, in December, the Fed was worried about tighter financial conditions. They were, they, they were saying financial conditions have tightened, and that as a result, we've got to start easing soon. And since that point, financial conditions have eased dramatically. Goldman Sachs have their financial conditions index is calibrated to be the equivalent of basis points. Yeah, basis points. It's it's the financial conditions have eased by the equivalent of almost a hundred basis points of Fed cuts before the Fed has even started, and it does make a difference, as Julian said. Household wealth in in just the fourth quarter climbed by almost five trillion, and households have less need to to, to save from their discretionary income. Uh, the savings rate is low, but it's still positive. People are still accumulating wealth. So why, so why is the Fed doing one thing and saying another? I mean, that's the bizarre thing, isn't it? I mean, they can't be. I mean, there's so many PhDs at the Fed. There must be somebody who realizes what's going on. Well, I think, I think I mean, I look, I mean, I have a very good friend who worked at the Fed, was Paul Tudor Jones's chief policy guy. And Rob uh, is in his early 70s now. And he has this great expression. I've watched the Fed man and boy for 50 years. They're always most bullish at the top and they've never caught a turn, <laughs> right? And I truly believe that their forecasting is poor. I think that uh, we know that Chris Wallace Swift switched to looking at anecdotal dev evidence at the end of last year. It was one of the reasons why he tipped towards this more negative stance. Uh, we all know with anecdotes, you can find an anecdote that fits your view. And I do feel fundamentally, Michael, that there is this institutional design. I've been told by friends who talk directly to the Fed that uh, a recession is not an option this year. And as I said, it comes back, I think, to a fear of, the tr of another Trump administration and what that can potentially do. So I think you've got a Fed that is predisposed to look for the silver lining and to try desperately. Because in all of the data, I mean, I just got a report from a bunch of my policy friends recently. They said, oh, well, you know, the data is... It's got kind of better and it's a bit uncomfortable, but they, but they trust that everything is going their way anyway. They're, so they're still going to push ahead with those, that first rate cut in June. And you sit here and go, 
I don't think, I don't think the Fed would really drive up unemployment significantly in order to meet the 2% target. If the Fed gets to 3%-ish, if getting down to 2% involves a significant cost of the economy, they're not going to do it. They're just, uh, they'll be happy with 3%. They'll never admit it. They'll say the 2% is the target and, you know, talk about the final mile and all that <laughs> nonsense. But in reality, they're just not going to run that final mile. But Although so, that bad, Joseph, you were there. Yeah, right. so I, I would say that, so we all look at the equity market going to the moon. We see what's happening in a dog with hat coin and so forth. <laughs> and so we know that financial conditions probably aren't, aren't very uh, tight. But that's not how the Fed perceives it, strangely enough. You will have really important people from the Fed uh, for example, president of the New York Fed, John Williams, go on record and say he thinks financial conditions are the tightest they've been for over 20 years. That's how they see the world. Um, and I think it's helpful to look at things from their perspective. And so the way they look at this is they look at something called real interest rates, which is nominal minus expected inflation. So if you look at the world that way, you'll see that real interest rates are about 2%. Now, is 2% real? Is that restrictive or not? Well, then you have to look at it another Fed tool, and the Fed being mostly comprised of PhD economists who are, as Julian mentioned, not very good at forecasting, <laughs> they'll say that, well, the neutral rate in the world, that, that's the benchmark to know whether or not monetary policy is tight or not, is 0.5%. So if 2% being much higher than 0.5%, obviously we're being very tight, right? And after, we're looking at inflation, and it's, it, it's uh, you know, it came down from, let's say, 7 8% to 3 4%. So it looks like it's working. And so even if the stock market goes to the moon, even though these financial condition indexes um, continue to loosen, well, according to my model, according to this framework, uh, I'm tightening financial conditions. Let's, and let's I agree, this you. is nonsense. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's <laughs> the game. I agree. Playing. Where does this neutral rate come from, this idea of it being half a percent? It comes from these very complex models where they put in all these inputs their idea of what's going on, and out comes this magic number of half a percent. And in reality, if you tweak, if you tweak the inputs to the model, you get a different number. So why not, why not just put your finger in the air and say, well, I think <laughs> that it's, it's actually 1%. Uh, more. I think they'd do a better job that way. And to, to your point, Johnny, the, the error bands for these models are enormous. You really right. can't set policy to them. That, that's ridiculous. And, and I think Julian makes a good point about the institutional fear of, of, a, you know, of a Trump administration. So I used to work at the New York Fed and you can actually look at public donation data, and you can see that uh, at the New York Fed, about 90%, 95% of the people donate to uh, Team Biden. So you know, they don't like the orange man. That's, uh, <laughs> that's very well understood. Like gold did, Bitcoin is establishing itself as a macro asset that potentially helps hedge against the government devaluation of your money. Finally, you can easily access Bitcoin in a low-cost ETF with the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, ticker HODL. Search the ticker HODL in your brokerage app today. Visit vanek.com slash HODLFG to learn more. That's vanek.com slash HODLFG. Now the disclosures. Investing involves risk and you can lose money on an investment in the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, also known as the Trust or HODL. The value of Bitcoin and therefore the value of the trust shares could decline rapidly, including to zero. You could lose your entire principal investment. For a more complete discussion of the risk factors relative to the trust, carefully read the prospectus link below. Thanks, let's get back to the interview. So the, the Federal Reserve, the you know, American uh, uh, Central Bank, where Joseph used, used to work and you know, Joseph uh, printed the money, they have a dual mandate. So they, they, they do not care about crypto. And officially, they don't care about, uh, they, they don't care about the stock market uh, uh, either. Their mandate is uh, you know, low unemployment and stable inflation. Their target rate is uh, 2%. So the issue we have now, inflation was super high, and it's uh, gone down dr dramatically to 3%, but it may be stable. So, and the Federal Reserve has committed to cutting interest rates uh, what, what a lot of the, the folks are, are, are saying, especially Julian, is that it might not be appropriate to cut interest rates because the U.S. economy is is too hot. Uh, but they will, Joseph, uh, you, you think that they might, number one, because they, they have committed to and the Fed really does follow on their word, typically, right? And, and number two, they do have a institutional fear of the orange man. Is that is that correct, Joseph? I think they think from their perspective, because real interest rates are high relative to where they think neutral is, they think that they are being restrictive and they have reiterated that over and over again yeah. even though i think we no one here believes that do you also think they they have a strong commitment to their forward guidance they believe that because they said they're probably going to cut three times this year they need to go ahead and and do that Stop because the process, yeah. yeah because otherwise the forward guidance loses credibility don't 
follow through with it, it loses credibility. You won't be able to. I mean, use they could tweak time. it, Johnny. So we might get. I mean, we're close. I would say it's a coin flip as to whether they would put keep the three dots in for this year, cuts yeah. or drop it to two. But they're going to cut. I think that's the point. And you and I would sit here and go, on what basis? On what rationale? You've got six percent nominal GDP. It's hardly slowed at all. So however you parse that, right? I mean, the equity boys may say, you know. My wet dream is I wake up in the morning and inflation is at zero. But when, you know, that's great. If no one on GDP stays at six and real growth just accelerates to fill that gap. And when you've got sub 4% unemployment, you're in a real tough situation trying to grow an economy at 6% with 4% unemployment and not create inflation. So, but, you know, they, I think it's insane for them to do it, but they seem determined to push ahead. And our job here is only to come out and look at what the consequences are. Of that. And I think they're bearish for the bond market. They're broadly <coughs> bullish for asset prices, although you may get some indigestion if the bond market wobbles too far and too fast, especially with a very overvalued US equity market where the money is starting to come out of the high tech sector and move into these more cyclical plays, which are emblematic of an economy that's re-accelerating. So commodities, industrials, you know, things like the, you know, some of the European indexes. But it's, I think it's just a massively good macro market. And so tomorrow the Federal Reserve is, is going to have its meeting at 2 p.m. Eastern time. They're going to uh, put out their uh, summary of economic pr- projections. And then 30 minutes later, you know, Fed Chair Jay Powell is going to be uh, interviewed by, by the press. On the spectrum of the, the Jay Powell who said, you know, in I think uh, 2022 at Jackson Hole, pain is, is coming uh, versus the, the Jack, uh, Jay Powell of, of recent saying, actually, because real interest rates have declined, uh, you know, we may cut interest rates as, as many as three times uh, um, uh, this year in, in 2024. Which Jay Powell, Joseph, do you think we're going to get tomorrow? Uh, I'm still waiting for that pain to come. So I, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that I, I think tomorrow, like Julian mentioned, it's a coin flip. So just for context, in December, they guided towards three rate cuts this year. Between then and now, we've had inflation coming in a bit stronger than expected. And so there's some speculation as to whether or not the Fed, maybe this time around, will guide towards two cuts instead of three cuts this year. Uh, I tend to think that this meeting will be very much like the past, where they just guide towards three hikes and three cuts this year. Uh, they've always believed that the data would be bumpy, as they say, and you know that's, it has been bumpy. But I also think that if you look at it from their perspective, the market has been pricing out a lot of cuts. And so a few months ago, the market was pricing as many as five, seven cuts this year. And now they're on three cuts on the same page as the Fed. And so there's really no need for, for the Fed to signal additional um, hawkishness because the market has, in part, done that job for them. And the, the theme, really, of the Federal Reserve thinking that financial conditions are tight because the short-term interest rate is at 5.5%, which historically, you know, over the past 20 years is, is somewhat high, when actually credit spreads are very low, stock market at all-time highs. Uh, I mean, I, there are, you know, meme coins being printed on Solana that within 24 hours get a market <laughs> cap of a billion dollars. You know, pretty, pretty uh, obvious that financial conditions are, are quite easy and loose. Uh, Michael, how do you, you explain this, specifically your work on, on liquidity? Uh, you know, how does central bank liquidity, how has it expanded even as the Federal Reserve has raised interest rates and has attempted to reduce its balance sheet by via quantitative tightening and has accomplished that some, somewhat? Let me try and answer it this way. I think we're in a, the, the thing to start with is to say that we're in a very different world here. We're in a world where capital spending is no longer driving economies. We're basically living in a world where financial markets are acting as refinancing mechanisms, not new financing mechanisms. In other words, there's so much debt out there, $350 trillion worldwide, with an average maturity of five years. It means you've got to roll the debt every year of about $70 trillion. And to do that, you need balance sheet. And think of a small-time example of a home mortgage. If you don't get the, the, the roll on your home mortgage, you're homeless. It doesn't matter about what the interest rate you pay is. You need to find someone who's going to lend to you. And that's the point with the financial system. With so much debt out there, you've got to get the roll. And you need liquidity and balance sheet capacity to do that. And that's what I think the central banks are doing. So I don't think interest rates matter out there, particularly. Uh, I mean, obviously, to some they do. And there's a lot of pouring over, you know, is it going to be three cuts, two cuts, one cut, whatever. But generally, the liquidity cycle bottomed in October of 2022, just after the British guilt crisis. And that was the wake-up call to policymakers. 
and it's likely to peak out in late 2025, early 26. And through this period, liquidity has gone up, the markets have gone up, and rate expectations, policy rate expectations from the Fed or whoever have whipsawed either side of that trend. Sometimes they're going up, sometimes they're going down. It hasn't mattered the drop to the market. What really matters is liquidity. And that's what the central banks are doing. And I would give you an anecdote that when I first started in the business in the mid-1980s, I remember I was sitting in Salomon Brothers in New York on the trading desk 10 days after the stock market crash. And I was talking to a trader and he interrupted me and took a call. And he wrote down this big futures order. And he said, put the phone, and he said, that was the New York Fed buying. So point there being is that what's really critical to central bankers is financial stability and the integrity of the sovereign debt and capital markets. They were buying, the, the, the Fed was buying bonds. Futures. bonds. No, they're buying futures and stocks. Really? Yeah. That is uh, not official And policy. they're not supposed to do that. Yeah, that, I, wow, that is, uh, yeah. uh, didn't know that. Whatever you have to do to keep your boss solvent. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so Michael, uh, how will liquidity continue to increase from the Federal Reserve if they remain committed to quantitative tightenings? Uh, so they're reducing their balance sheet. And the reverse repo facility, uh, that the, basically the money that's coming out of this uh, enormous facility to house excess liquidity, it's gone down from you know, trillions to hundreds of billions, so still a lot of money. But ultimately, as that goes down to zero, where is the marginal liquidity going to come from? Well, I think it's a challenge. And there's an old saying in Ireland that if you want to travel to Dublin, don't start from here. And that's the reality the Fed has got. I think what they need to do is to get bank reserves rising. And that's what I've been saying for a long, long time. The problem with the U.S. banking system is that JPM is in great, great shape, but the regional banks are not. And if you look at when the, the time of the SVB crisis in March of last year, look at the cash holdings of the regional banks, the small banks. They're exactly the same as they are now. So that hasn't changed. JPM has pulled in huge amounts of liquidity. And look at the share price of JPM. It's rocketing, just to reflect that. But the regional banks have got a problem. So the Federal Reserve needs to get general bank reserves rising, and I hope that spills out. And that's exactly what Laurie Logan was saying in January about what the Federal Reserve needed to do. And I think that's an interesting call because she knows a lot about the SOMA accounts and how the Fed balance sheet works. But broadly speaking, what you've had in the last few months is basically, or last, well, last year or so, is that the balance sheet has come down, but the liquidity creating elements of the balance sheet have gone up. So there's been a net liquidity increase by the Fed because of things from the TGA, as Julian mentioned, the reverse repo account, as you've mentioned, all these factors have come in. It's a lot more challenging in the next few months to get that unless they change policy and they try and find some way of getting liquidity in. Now, I think that one of the things they may be doing that is changing the rules, lo and behold, and trying to get the banks to own more debt. And just look at the latest US money supply figures as an example. US, I, mean, I don't look at money supply that often, but it's important times to watch. M3 is starting to accelerate in the US, but it's not because of lending to the private sector. It's because of increased funding to the state. In other words, they're funding the government deficit. Milton Friedman would be turning in his grave if he saw that. That's what's it's going It's inflation. On. Huh? It's called inflation. It's called monetary inflation, exactly. That's what they're doing. They're not telling us. Now let's uh, talk about currency, so like one fiat currency relative to, to another Julian, what do you think about the U.S. dollar, which is the global reserve currency, rather than focusing on a, you know, its long-term future, but like a sh short-term, uh, are you a dollar bull or a dollar bear and why? Relative to, say, the euro, the yen, So I, I think we're at a really very important inflection point. Uh, the, the caveat being that we've been here before and we've backed off. It looks like the dollar is showing signs of weakness, of accelerative weakness. And you would expect, as you move into a reflationary cycle, global reflation cycle, that generally the dollar underperforms. And in fact, a dollar weakness on a relative basis is an integral part typically of that reflation because it's the denominator of a lot of asset prices. So as it falls, those assets rise in value. Um, so, you know, there's not many currencies which it's truly broken down in. Dollar Mex, it just took out a trend line from 2008 on a closing basis. You can see, obviously, the weakness of the dollar versus, say, gold. Silvers, which is a super high beta, essentially replacement for the dollar, is starting to show signs of wanting to break out, and it's something that we've been playing. But against a lot of the other fiat currencies, you're just not seeing it yet, Jack, right? And so I think I'm a structural dollar bear. Um, 
and I, but I want to see some of the confirmation in some of the other price action. I, it's, I think it's coming. I think a Fed that cuts, that when it isn't legitimate to cut, where it isn't warranted to cut, and essentially keeps real rates too low against other central banks that seem to be taking a much more cautious and grown-up approach, I think is a recipe for dollar weakness, but I have to see it in the price action. So you can envision a scenario where the Federal Reserve cuts interest rates uh, before and in steeper fashion than the European Central Bank? Well, I think the ECB can still cut, but I think it's much more warranted in Europe than it is actually in the US. I think it's a policy error in the US because you don't have the economic porridge, far from being Goldilocks just right, remains on balance too hot. And that's where you get a policy error. And I think, you know, generally as well, I think that all the money in the world is sitting in the dollar. Right? It's in the US funding a vast current account deficit and a budget deficit. And it's all been sucked into this in this sort of re reflexive, self-reinforcing, virtuous cycle. Very similar to we had going into the dot-com bubble, very similar to we had going into 2009. And if we get reflation, that's not usually hugely beneficial for the US, It's the, you know, because you take your money out of very high PE tech stocks and you buy cheap commodities and mining companies and, and oil and so on and so forth. And so I think that cycle is beginning showing signs of picking up, Jack. But as I said, the proof is in the price action and you can't jump the gun on this. So while PA, I'm very long, you know, copper and uh, gold and platinum, I really want to buy things like silver. I really want to short dollars. But outside, say, dollar mex, I don't have that technical signal that says it's on, it's now, do it. Julian, what, what, so you say you like all these uh, hard metals, basically things that are denominated in dollars. Uh, what would it take for you to say, I'm, I'm bullish on Bitcoin? So I've got some. Okay. Raul finally convinced me to do <laughs> it. Uh, and I got some around 12,000. Of course, I, you know, not enough. Um, Good, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm riding that one for the moment in the same way, you know, Joseph and Michael said, you know, we, I, I agree, we get strong asset prices in, for, you know, at least probably through uh, until the beginning of the or the end of the third quarter, you know, we'll see what happens in that kind of classic September, October kind of period where things get a little dicey. Um, but I just personally, I view it as just a lot. I, I can't do what Raul does and just buy something and just hold it and not be concerned about the P&L swings. I, so I will trade this thing. So I think, you know, at the point that I think that we hit vulnerability in terms of asset prices brought along by once again weakness in the bond market or reinsurgence in inflation i will cut my position and look to get back in again at lower levels and do you kind of view it as like a you know a triple levered nasdaq position so basically very levered stocks or do you view it as gold because it is i don't see it as gold ultimately yeah. Yeah, yeah. i really don't i'm i i i'm happy to debate this one but i just think bitcoin is or crypto in general is too good at avoiding the rules. And so I don't see it as a long term store of wealth. I really don't. I think governments will be forced to act to contain it or at least limit its geographical fungibility uh, at some point because we're going into this higher inflation, high debt world. Rules just change, guys. We're going to be looking at things like exchange controls, financial repression, all those sorts of things. And crypto is too good uh, in that sense. But, it, and I, but I said on Real Vision, you know, it could be the world's best trade. In my mind, Michael, what what are your views on on crypto? Well, I think that uh, you know Julian's raised a very important point, and that is that uh, the authorities can change the rules. And you've only got to look at what happened with the Gold Act in the U.S. in 1934 to actually show that. And for those of you that don't know, gold was banned in terms of private holdings. I think I'm correct in saying that the fines in 1934 were, I think it was fifty thousand uh, dollars and seven <laughs> years in lot. jail. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and that focuses the mind, yes. right? Um, uh, so they could do that, and they did, what happened if you if you don't know the story? I um, mean, it's, it's a fascinating story, but it was a way of actually devaluing the dollar. So the U.S. Treasury called in all uh, private gold deposits uh, into the Treasury. You had to submit them at a price of twenty dollars an ounce or there or thereabouts, and then uh, basically they pulled them into the Treasury, and then they progressively revalued gold each day. And there is this actually a true story that um, um, I think Roosevelt and his advisor met every day over bacon and eggs, uh, and they, they said, this is what the gold price is going to be today. And they progressively pushed it up to $34. And that's how it was done. And there was a huge capital gain, effectively, uh, for the Federal Reserve during that period. 
So they could do a similar exercise of basically making crypto illegal or at least try. I mean, that, that's a risk. Aside from that, I'm hugely bullish <laughs> um, because I think that this is, this is the way forward because you've got a monetary inflation. As I, as I said right at the beginning of, the, of this panel, uh, this is like 1919, if you like, in Germany. And I think what you've got is a huge fiscal deterioration going on. Uh, and you need some protection against that. And just to kind of put that in context, and you can think of this in sort of very simple math terms, but if you look at how much debt or the debt increase as a percent of GDP for the US, and the US, I'm not hitting on the US, because actually the US is probably the cleanest shirt in the laundry here. But if you look, go back to year 2000, and you look at the size of the deficit, which was basically zero, interest rates were low, and the debt GDP ratio was about 38% or something like that, okay? What that meant was debt to GDP was growing at a rate of under 1% of GDP every year, okay? You do the maths today, the answer is about 9%. If you redo the maths for 2040, it's 15%. So what you've got is that debt every year is growing at 15% of GDP just from compounding. And it's because you've got a structurally high fiscal deficit because of mandatory spending and yeah. aging demographics. And there's no way they can get off that unless they renege on these promises. Well, let alone we're fighting two wars, a kinetic yeah. war or two kinetic wars, a cold war with China and a climate change war. Yeah. I mean, the amount of money that has to get spent, guys. And this is why you should expect regulation, right? This sort of laissez-faire world where you think you've had it off, right? And you can move your money all over the world. Those days are coming to an end. You are going to have to think very, very carefully where you warehouse your cash, where you hold physically your crypto, right? Where you want it to be regulated because it is going to be controlled. But just a lot, a lot back of wars... to what you said before, Michael, when, when uh, the US did what they did with uh, gold in, in, in 1934, that was effectively a currency debasement. And right. that was to help get out of the, the Great Depression. And, and it worked, had, right? It kind yeah, of, yeah, and it, it worked. It yeah. worked. That was the thing. You know, it, you had a pickup in nominal GDP growth. And the same thing uh, when Nixon took uh, yeah. the US off the gold standard. Uh, but obviously, a lot of the increase in nominal GDP growth was uh, through inflation rather than actual real growth. So we do have, you know, and I think that's the attra attraction of crypto. It is the hedge against currency debasement. And to me, I, I do think that that is the way the, uh, the US is going, particularly with these soaring deficits. If you look at the debt to GDP, in fact, after the pandemic, when there was this enormous fiscal stimulus, debt to GDP, I think it dropped from about 130% to 120% because you measured debt to GDP in nominal terms yeah. and the nominal GDP growth was so great. The denominator went up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And that's the thing. So that is how the US and, and all countries get out of this problem is by, by getting a, a, a period of very, very high nominal GDP growth. It's how we in this country got out of the problem at the end of the Second World War. Yeah. So that might be in a lot of printing. Um, we, we've got we've to leave it there, but everyone should check out all of your work. I'm starting out with this order, super macro, mi2fedguide.com, and cross-border cap. Lightning round at the end. Uh, you know, uh, S&P 500 targets are, of course, nonsense. But if I were to say, where do you think the 10-year bond yield is? Uh, S&P 500, like the stocks, like in terms of higher or lower, and Bitcoin. Johnny, I'll give you an exemption. You, if you don't want to, you don't have to say Bitcoin because because I know you don't follow crypto. But uh, starting from Johnny going over here. So what, what at the end of end of the year, year at December 31st, 2024. Okay, I'm going to say uh, for the 10 year, I'm going to say somewhere between, well, okay, let's be more precise. I'll say 470. So higher. You could just say higher or lower. Yeah, 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 yeah. higher. Okay, higher. For the S&P, I'll also say higher. And uh, probably for crypto, I would also say higher. Julian? So I'll say higher on bond yields, flat on the S&P, and slightly higher on crypto. Joseph? Say higher on equity markets, higher on crypto, and higher in bond yields. Yeah, I'd say, I mean, my, my prediction has been five and a quarter percent at least on the US 10-year. I think the S&P, I think probably marginally higher than where we are. And Bitcoin's a very difficult one, but I would say, you know, within five years, you're going to see 250,000. This is all very consensus. I'm going to sell everything. <laughs> yeah, you're higher, 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 higher. Yours. Uh, that yours. means something. Well, um, thank you all so much for, for joining, and thank you, everyone, for listening to this.
Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Remember to check out vanek.com slash hodlfg to learn more about the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, ticker HODL. A reminder that Forward Guidance episodes are available on all podcast apps and on Twitter, where I post them regularly at JackFarley96. Thanks again. Until next time.